So um, for um, ending this call, we are very happy to welcome Marta Garnello to discuss exactly this topic. So Marta is working on the, uh, the introduction of symbols in learning and in particular in reinforcement learning. And that's going to be the, the subject of the talk uh, of today. So Marta is um, a scientist working at DeepMind and also uh, um, working uh, at Imperial College of London. And uh, well, I will let you uh, the, the floor for describing more about, uh, about this thematic. Thanks, uh, as, Nicolas. As usual, you can ask questions during the talk, uh, either on the, the uh, question and answer of, of Zoom, and we will try to forward that if it is a, a question that are trying to uh, clarify a little bit some part of the talk. Uh, for more open questions, more bro broad questions, you can uh, wait for the last 10 minutes of the talk uh, to ask it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to assume that you guys can see my screen. If you can't, then please let me know. Um, I think I can see the chat. I'm not very good with Zoom, but we'll figure this thing out as we go. And this should be my laser pointer, which I also hope everyone can see. If you yep. don't see a laser pointer or any slide, please shout. OK, cool. Yep, we'll see <laughs> Amazing. Good. <laughs> Let's go. So hi, everyone. My name is Marta. As Nicola mentioned, I am a scientist at DeepMind. Uh, where I have uh, historically mostly work on deep generative models, uh, meta learning, and as of recently a little bit on uh, multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning, actually. Um, and today, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about, however, is one that I did uh, a while ago. It's, it's dear to my heart because I, this was at the beginning of my PhD, uh, a lot of a few years ago, um, and it's on uh, symbolic representations and, and reinforcement learning, as Nicola mentioned, and how to merge um, these two areas. Um, a small disclaimer at the beginning, I am not, uh, I am not, I don't have formal symbolic uh, training myself. Um, a lot of the motivation behind this comes from the fact that Imperial College uh, works a lot with logic and with symbolic um, AI and my uh, PhD advisor at the time himself, Murray, was very interested in this topic. Um, so that's where the inspiration come from. Um, but to start with, maybe let me give you a very small uh, a high level understanding of what symbolic AI is. Um, classic symbolic AI is this framework uh, that deals with uh, symbols, um, as the name would suggest. Um, and it consists of these language like prepositions uh, uh, that describe data. Um, so these prepositions would, come, uh, would uh, consist of so called constants. Those would be objects or entities in your data set, as well as predicates that would describe the relationships between um, those constants. Um, to give you a very famous example, here is a, a family tree. Um, and you would could say that the constants of this family tree are the people. So you would have Abe, Homer, Lisa, and so on. Um, and the predicates would be, for example, the relations between these um, people. So for example, Homer is the father of Lisa. That could be a predicate. Um, you can see straight away that the way you are reasoning with this type of language is at a very conceptual level. So you have ideas such as like father and humans and whatnot, which is something that we don't see a lot in deep learning, right? Um, so straight by definition, straight out the gate, we have uh, this type of, of, um, of inference. Um, and beyond that, once we have established some um, predicates, we can actually create new predicates and from these very basic building blocks actually create some more complex uh, uh, relations. So we can then, for example, say if we know that Homer is the father of Lisa and Abe is the father of Homer, we can define what it means to be a grandfather. Um, and um, what's interesting about this as well is that with only one example or with this definition, we can actually query our data set and check whether some relations that we've never seen before actually hold or not. Um, and it should generalize because we're going by these uh, pre-specified definitions, which is really useful. Um, so all of this was obviously, as most of you will know, you uh, used quite a lot in the past uh, and beyond just very small examples like this little uh, Simpsons family tree. Um, two examples here, for example, is that we have on the left uh, a rule-based expert system to give like medical advice. Um, the reason you might want to use some symbolic method here is because symbolic methods, as you saw in the example before, are very interpretable, right? So as humans, especially when it comes to medicine, we want to know why certain decisions were taken. And, and that's why humans often, or researchers, have relied more on the symbolic methods. Um, you can also do quite interesting things. I was very surprised to find out tasks like uh, uh, navigating the small submarine and the lake, uh, all based on like logic rules and little uh, symbolic uh, manipulations. 
uh, which looks very complicated but very cool as well. So clearly this is not just for like simple family trees and there's some real world applications that we can uh, find as well. Um, so maybe to outline the benefits that um, I've been mentioning about symbolic AI. Um, first of all, as I said, they're very interpretable. Uh, this comes from the fact that we are defining not only what the constants are, but also what the puts are. So to us humans, they're very readable. Um, they also often generalize at this conceptual level of the ideas that we have defined. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if you define what a grandfather is, you can then generalize to new pairs of people and ask whether or not they have this relationship or not. Um, and then finally, there is already a very broad literature of well-established solvers and planning algorithms and so on um, that we could leverage if we manage to move more into the realm of symbolic AI. Uh, some of the downsides, and I'd say the biggest, <laughs> is uh, the fact that the knowledge needs to be handcrafted. So as I mentioned, both the, uh, the constant as well as the predicates are defined by hand in advance. Um, and you might think, oh, maybe this is not such a huge deal. I mean, look at that little family tree. I can sit down and write down the, the, the constants and the predicates quite quickly. Um, and fair enough for kind of this example, but whenever we want to move on to the real world, that is a little bit more messy. And then trying to actually look at all the objects in the scene, for example, and their relations, uh, very quickly you run into a pretty big problem. So this does not scale. We cannot have uh, a human label all of this. Um, this is where neural networks come in, uh, changing gears a little bit. Um, as I'm sure you are all aware, neural networks um, are this. We, we can uh, think of them as this black box model that carries out uh, tasks. For example, we have uh, image classification in this particular example. Um, it's a parameterized uh, function approximator, and we're going to, in the parameters for this model, are going to be updated automatically from the data using gradient descent. So we don't have to handcraft anything. We don't really care what that black box model in general looks like, as long as it eventually gives us the right answer for our training and, the, and our test set. Um, maybe to compare a little bit, neural networks, what the downsides and the benefits of these like neural networks and deep learning are, uh, maybe start with the downsides. Uh, as uh, Because we are not really constraining um, the space of you know, the, the representation space of neural networks, they are usually not really interpretable because why would it fall out automatically? Um, in general, they've been shown to not generalize very well, almost at any level, like neural networks are quite brittle. Um, and they're hard to uh, combine with these well-established solvers and planning algorithms that I mentioned earlier because they are not working at the symbol level, right? Um, one of the, well, deep learning, as you might have heard, has a lot of benefits, of course. I'm not going to go into all of them. Uh, but one of them, of course, is that the knowledge doesn't have to be handcrafted. So we don't care what the representations look like because as the, the parameters are updated by themselves. Um, and of course, many other benefits. So if we look at this very specific list that I picked out of uh, downsides and, and, and uh, upsides of both symbolic learning and deep learning, uh, they seem to be complementary in at least these aspects. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, of course, more to them. Um, but this begs the question if we could somehow bring these two worlds a little closer together, right? Can we still have interpretability, uh, use them with like known planning algorithms, have a generalization and data efficiency that is uh, good for learning, um, but at the same time not have to sit down and handcraft everything and learn from data the way that deep neural networks would. Um, and this was the motivation for our uh, paper uh, a while ago, uh, which was called Towards Deep Symbolic Reinforcement Learning. Um, and what we wanted to do there is uh, we wanted to build a system that would take in images um, and then eventually pick up an action, so it was an agent. Um, but ra rather than working from images directly the way you would have, for example, DQN at the time, um, you would have these very specific uh, steps in between. The first one being you want to extract symbols from the images, then somehow work with these symbols to build some representations that are then useful, and then do some reinforcement learning on top of that, um, on top of this more symbolic representation. Um, just to maybe show the environment before I go into more detail of the model, this was very, very simple. <laughs> it was this 2D environment with very basic shapes. Uh, we had an agent, which is this uh, cross here in the middle, that's the agent, and the agent is the only uh, object that is moving in this environment, so everything else is static. Um, there's going to be uh, objects that are either pos give positive reward when collected, like the circles, or give negative, like the squares and the x's. Um, and the whole point of this environment was that we had a setup where we had a grid, so this was fixed and then it was always the same. And then we had a setup where it was random. So 
at the beginning of an episode, you would sample uh, new positions for all of the objects, and then uh, the agent had to figure out the best path around to collect positive and avoid the negatives. Um, and we wanted to show that um, reason that being able to uh, reason at this object level would make for a faster generalization than just doing it from scratch from pixels with DQN. Um, so the way we did these three phases uh, went as follows. So the first one, as I mentioned, is the uh, extraction of these uh, low-level symbols. And um, the way we went about it is we had we took in the images, uh, we looked at, we passed them through a neural network and, and picked out salient areas of the image. Um, uh, and then we would characterize these salient images by the filters that they would get from the from the neural from the neural network. Um, and based on these uh, different uh, activations, we could then say, oh, what type of object is it, or what type of symbol. Um, and we would cluster them uh, by that. And then we could say for each of these activations, do we think it belongs to a specific symbol? We would also threshold to have a certain amount of sparsity. So we didn't look at every pixel, but only above a certain um, activation threshold. Um, so this would give us a list essentially of the position within the image, which we had from the convolutional position, um, as well as the type, which we had uh, acquired by um, um, comparing the little uh, feature spaces. Um, bear in mind that the in, in our particular case, because we are not uh, actually explicitly asking for individual objects, uh, one object might, for example, have two activations, right? So we're not saying that one symbol here corresponds exactly to an object, but they would be consistent across time, right? So every time you see a circle, you would see two of those symbols essentially of whatever type. And as long as the types are consistent over time, then that is actually fine. We're not making any claims as to if the symbols are actually specific objects in the real image. Um, so then with these representations, uh, there were a few steps that we needed to do in order to make them a bit more useful. Um, firstly, we wanted to bake in the notion of continuity across time. Um, so we had to track them essentially, right? So we knew in a specific frame what types and what objects are there with what positions, and then how do we match them to the next frame? Um, and we would do that by uh, comparing different distances and so on. So this was also a bit, uh, uh, it, we had a specific threshold and hand coded. And, and then rather than looking at the absolute positions, we would actually look at the, at the uh, differences between all of the um, uh, pairs of objects, which is very similar to what uh, relation nets are doing, and we'll come to them in, in a little bit. Um, so with this, we were essentially have interactions between two specific objects, between every object in the image, or whatever it found, with, uh, whatever object it found, we would see how the interactions change over time. Um, and with this, we would pass this to our uh, reinforcement learning agent and learn from these like higher level symbolic representations. Um, and what was interesting is that we had as a baseline, as you can see, we had DQN. Um, and in the grid environment, so whenever it was fixed and all it had to do was just move the same way, uh, DQN would completely destroy us. Obviously, DQN very quickly in very few iterations would learn how to behave uh, perfectly. My algorithm, which would obviously sometimes not pick up the, the symbols and uh, perfectly, uh, it got just about 70%, um, and it never really reached fully 100%. But uh, what was interesting is that when we then switched to the random environment, uh, our algorithm and mind the different y-axis um, got to the exact same performance almost at the same time as in the grid environment, whereas DQN took a lot longer to take off. Um, it eventually learned, so after a long time, DQN learned how to behave in the random environment, but it takes much, much, much longer uh, than our algorithm, which didn't really mind whether it was um, uh, random or in this grid environment. Um, and finally, what's maybe also even more interesting is, is that we trained our algorithm on uh, the fixed data set, so it only ever saw the fixed setup, um, and then tested it on the random one, right? And, and in that particular case, DQN never managed to learn because, of course, it's completely overfitted to the grid and it's never seen anything else. Um, whereas our, again, basically same performance of about 70% um, uh, that it got at the beginning. So even though it's not doing stellar in terms of performance initially, the performance is consistent no matter what type of environment it is, it is playing with, which was kind of exciting and kind of the message that we were uh, looking to tell in this particular paper. Um, so this is a very simple environment and experiment <laughs> because this was uh, 2016, I think. So this is a long time ago. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about a little bit is what has happened since then, right? What have people, people have obviously thought about this a little bit more. And I think what's interesting is that people that there have been advances as almost these three boxes that I mentioned um, that I've now renamed instead of low-level symbols extraction, I'm going to call it extracting useful representations, how to then process these representations, and then applying them to some downstream task. Um, 
and the rest of the talk i would like to kind of um, go through different recent papers since like our paper and now um, that have done exactly this with the intent of um, either creating representations that are more symbolic or processing them in them in a way that actually uh, is again more symbol like um, and then how these are applied to downstream tasks uh, if at all um, sweet so with that i will start with extracting useful uh, representations um, and when i say useful i mean representations that are uh, that have some similarity with the symbolic representations that we mentioned earlier um, Two that come to mind, for example, are is a lot of body of work around uh, disentangled representations that I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, and then in general object-centric representations. Um, and I'm gonna have a little look at those two. Oh. Disentangled representations are neural network representations where each of the dimensions, so each of the numbers of the vector, um, encodes a different characteristic of an object. So, for example in the case of these chairs, and maybe modifying a single latent variable would always modify the size of the chair, no matter what example you're looking at, right? And maybe modifying a different dimension of that would change what type of chair it is, right? Um, the motivation between disentangled representations, and there's been a lot of work on it, is the hope that by having these disentangled representations, models would do better with combinatorial generalization, right? As humans, we think, okay, we, we, we'd like to think that we have some disentangled view of the world and then we can see a new combination like people can, the, the example people give often is like, you've never seen a blue banana, but you've seen blue and you've seen a banana, so you should be able to combine those. Whether or not this is how it works is, is a separate question, but there's been a, a big body of work focusing on, on this particular aspect. Um, there's two main ways that people have gone about um, re achieving these uh, disentangled representations. Um, the first one is by modifying the objective function directly, right? So putting some sort of extra constraints um, that would uh, push the model towards having these type of representations. Um, this has been done in GAN space um, by weighing differently the elbow with VAEs um, or vac factor VAE, which is also adding an additional K loss to the normal VAE loss. And as you can see, they all do a pretty decent job at, um, at reconstructing uh, and, and, and breaking it into different uh, disentangled uh, representations. Um, a second way that you could think about getting this uh, disentanglement is by modifying the representational structure. So defining a representation that inherently is going to be disentangled. So for example, the model tagger um, did this by saying, okay, we're going to have our representations are going to consist of several Zs and several masks, um, and we're going to iteratively let them draw on this canvas only in the area of, of the mask. Um, and by creating this, they create, uh, they create this model that inherently then selects for the different numbers on an image uh, for for mixed MNIST. Uh, you can also use models like the structured VAE, in which which allows you um, to feed some of the characteristics which you might know that are labeled. For example, in the case of digital Digits, you know their digits, so you can uh, train this part of the representation in a supervised manner. But then the handwriting style, for example, you don't have any label for that. And that's the second part of that representation, which will be unsupervised. Um, and this allows for that combination, which inherently is also going to give you some disentanglement. Um, there, there's a lot of this work, and it has been quite good for generating these disentangled representations. But I'd like to mention a little word of caution about thinking when thinking about disentangled representations and how they affect for combinatorial generalization. Um, because as I mentioned, the motivation for a lot of people to have these disentangled representations is the hope that at test time we can generalize better because we combine these disentangled representations. Um, there has been a paper very recently actually by Montero et al. Uh, that analyzes the generalization ability of uh, models that are meant to be disentangling their representations and actually reaches the conclusion that um, th it does not necessarily help at all. So that it matches more or less with the non-disentangling model. It is quite an interesting paper. And if any of you is interested in generalization in general, um, I would encourage you to read it because it also touches on the different types of generalization that you can have, right? Like generalization, this is, for example, they call extrapolation over here. So if you have three different uh, characteristics, like like translation, rotation, and shape, then uh, you can have a certain, just a single combination that you haven't observed, or maybe you can have a single uh, a shape and translation that you haven't observed across any rotation, or you can have what they call extrapolation. 
population. So there's a whole set of the data set that you haven't um, observed. And they very thoroughly analyze these different types of generalization <clears throat> for different models. Um, and I think that a lot of people throw a lot of generalization terms about, but often it's not very well studied. So this is a good pa first paper to go into um, this direction. Um, and unfortunately, a bit discouraging the fact that they found that it doesn't seem to help. Um, more to the point, uh, some research that we did a while ago um, in, uh, on, on scene uh, representation uh, at DeepMind as well, um, whereby basically we were looking at a scene from some viewpoints and then asking the model what that same scene would look like from a different viewpoint. Um, that also showed that we were able to do this combinatorial generalization pretty well, even though we did not have any constraints on the representation to be disentangled in any shape or form. Um, but it was still able to, having only seen spheres and only seen red objects that are never spherical, to then reconstruct red spheres. Um, so whether or not this disentanglement is necessary or not um, is a question that is still a bit up in the air. Um, yeah, but even though from the symbolic point of view, one might think that it is useful, maybe it's not. So uh, yeah. Um, good. Another way of uh, influencing the representations to make them actually more symbolic, and one that is maybe a bit also uh, that that makes sense, is to um, force your representations to adhere to a certain format, as imposed, for example, by a render. So what do you mean? What do we mean by this? If we have a scene and we assume that this scene was generated by a render, um, so uh, meaning that uh, the render it takes in this type of description of the scene. Um, we can then build in this renderer here into our model, assuming it's um, it's um, uh, differentiable, uh, and then we can train our model like this. So what this network here, the encoder, we're essentially learned to do is to output a representation in this particular format because it has to learn to produce something that the renderer can work with, right? Um, so therefore, your representations here in the middle will be interpretable and symbolic by design. Um, and the design is defined by this particular graphics engine. Um, there's also work on uh, graphics engines or renderers that are not differentiable. And then that's where you would have to use RL, obviously, because you cannot just uh, pass the gradients through that particular uh, renderer. Um, and the benefit of doing something like this is um, if we have a look at the results on the somewhat creepy data set, um, we can see that uh, if we take the original image, we can uh, modify the image at an object level or a concept level, right? So for example, once you have this image, you can tell it, okay, uh, let's take the, the little girl and we want to give her a new position. So that is very simple to do, right? Or a new pose and you flip it around or a new category. And now you're doing these like concept level uh, creations that you would normally not be as uh, able to do maybe with a, a normal neural network, right? And this is because you are describing the scene in these very symbolic terms that allow for this type of uh, manipulation. Um, so the previous model required you to have some sort of render and it's good, but it does require you to have a renderer, which you've also effectively specified yourself at some point, right? Um, a somewhat more unsupervised the way of doing all of this is the work of image or scene decomposition. Um, there is a model from a while ago called attend infer repeat, which essentially decomposed an image into uh, objects by iteratively drawing uh, the different objects. So you could see it starts with an image and then produces the first object, feeds them to the next state, and then produces the next object, and so on until it decides there's enough, and then just generates that image. Um, and what's interesting about this type of model is that it actually did very well in generalization. So this is a model that had only been trained on images with two num numbers. And, and then at test time, it was shown three numbers, and it was actually able to generalize and just create these three numbers, even though it's never seen this. Um, so that would involve one more iteration of steps. Um, other models, for example, draw, were not able to actually generate these three. So it would only do the two that I'd seen at test time and the training and uh, not be able to generalize like this. Um, this, of course, is also a while ago. Uh, in, since then, there's been some newer work that tries to also decompose scenes into objects and symbols. Um, so famously, we have Monet, which takes 3D scenes. Um, and very similar to Air observes them. In this particular case, they generate a mask. So it's an attention mask of where you're looking in the image. And then conditional on this mask and the image, they then generate some sort of color uh, color that is then being masked by the, by the mask. And then that's the first uh, generation of that iteration. And then you pass that and then generate step two and step three. And like this sequentially, uh, you generate the images. So some flair, flavors of the of the attempt in for repeat, but in this particular case, uh, for 3D images. And what we could see is that the representations that we obtain here are very much like object 
space. So we see there is like the walls, there is the ground, and then the objects that it has found um, after masking, uh, which is really cool. So this is very similar to what we were trying to do in that first part of the of the model, which is extracting objects, extracting symbols. Um, but in our particular case, we had to threshold and uh, and then hack it a little bit, whereas here it's unsupervised and it's for 3D scenes. So this is really exciting to see that it's and actually has gone quite far in these past years. Um, so that was the first part. Now to the middle part. What do we do once we have um, these symbolic representations that we've extracted from um, images? Uh, and that's what I call the processing uh, representations. Um, I'm going to mention a few. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff you can do, um, but a lot of some ideas that are reminiscent also of what you would do in, in symbolic learning. So there is uh, relational nets, which very similar to the predicates, look at the, the uh, two symbols and then kind of uh, process that. Um, attention, which is very similar, of course, and related, especially self-attention to relational learning. Um, and then what happens if we, on top of just looking at a static image, if we're actually looking over time? Um, and this is what, in our model, we were actually taking the difference between frames to kind of accommodate for time. But nowadays, there is very smart transition models that actually do a better job at doing this automatically. Um, so I'll start with the uh, relational uh, networks. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of them, um, they were published a while ago as well. And essentially, what they do is you take in an image, um, pass in through a convolutional neural network, um, and you get uh, very similar to what we were doing, essentially. You get for each of the convolutions, you get essentially some sort of uh, vector that describes uh, the activations. Um, and then with this ve vector of activations, you then concatenate all of the possible combinations between the rows of this vector, essentially. So you would get uh, this kind of square matrix, and then you pass each of those for, through MNLP. So what you're doing here is essentially you're forcing every part of the image to be combined with every other part. So obviously, this scales quadratically, but uh, usually for images, that's fine. Um, and what this is particularly useful for is for tasks that require relational uh, reasoning. So they applied it to the Cleverer data set, as you can see here. It's a data set that contains images of uh, 3D scenes of objects uh, that, contain, that are either like the spheres or cubes. Um, of different colors and, and, and textures. Um, and then there's a question associated with, um, with these images. Uh, so for example, in this case, what size is a cylinder that is left to the brown metal thing that is left of the big sphere? So as you can see, a lot of relational thinking. You have to look at what is next to what and so on. Um, and as you would expect, this type of architecture that very specifically assumes, it doesn't take symbols the way we did, but it assumes that every patch in the image is treated almost like a symbol. Um, and uh, it does particularly well. So what you're looking at here is uh, the accuracy for specific tasks. Um, but what I, where it excels the most really is when you're looking at uh, comparing attributes of objects. So down here, if we're looking at comparing the size, comparing shape and so on, um, the relation net is this yellow bar here. Human performance is gray, so often it even outperforms humans. And then other models that are just basically based on LSTMs and whatnot, very simple without enforcing this, uh, this uh, relational combination um, actually do quite poorly on these particular tasks. So what's interesting, again, is that this informed decision to add this bias to, this, to the network architecture that is very reminiscent of this predicate combination um, has helped to actually perform, drive performance of, of the model. Um, related to this attention, in particular self-attention, I wanted to mention it because it's very similar actually to relation networks. Um, this is what I was showing earlier about relation networks. Um, this particular uh, box here is whatever you would put in here. Um, and attention is essentially the same, but instead of actually combining every single element in the, in the uh, vector with itself, you would uh, have basically pass them through MMLP matrix multiply them and get some type of weight matrix that tells you how much each of the rows is attending to every other row in that same vector and then you would again just multiply this with here so it is conceptually actually very similar to here because you're again having all to all comparisons um, but in this particular also you have this multiplicative interaction here which is actually has been shown to be very crucial for the expressivity of uh, attention models and the reason why transformers are basically as good as they are um, so as you, I'm sure, are familiar, attention has and transformers have been quite popular recently, um, particularly for land 
language modeling. Um, but I thought maybe here in the context of RL, it might be more interesting to look at a different example where attention, and in particular, this attention of individual parts of the image to each other was helpful for, again, doing RL tasks that uh, somewhat re require this relational reasoning. Um, this is a somewhat recent paper that had this curious environment whereby you have these pairs of squares um, and the goal is to get this white one here and in order to get this you have to um, so if you touch the the right box you get the left key so it's a bit of bizarre but essentially what this is saying <laughs> bear with me uh, if you get the green box here you get the purple key which means you can get this purple box get this orange key get this orange purple box red red white so basically you always you have to do some uh, planning in order order to get uh, to the actual white key. Um, and there's also deceptors as well. So sometimes if you, for example, have this uh, purple key, you can go here or here, as you can see in this tree here, and then that would mean that you are lost. And once you have the blue, you you basically, you have no access anymore to the, to the white key. Um, with this environment, what they showed with this type of planning is that uh, they compared this, what they called relational, which is again, just mostly the self-attention model uh, versus a normal baseline that was again, just a, a normal or the same exact RL agent, but without this attention at the front. Um, and it did much better when generalizing to longer solution paths. So when you actually had to get a lot of different keys, um, whereas here the performance deteriorated very quickly. Um, and it also did very well at generalizing to key colors that it had never seen before uh, during training, um, which was really encouraging as well. So this was uh, an interesting uh, result. Um, finally, I want to mention PrediNets as well. Um, this is a very big diagram and very intimidating looking. I don't want you to like actually take it all in. Um, just maybe to point out some similarities, you can see that this is an image. You are going to have two vectors that are again kind of attending to each other. So very similar uh, patterns, right? Um, maybe the, to point out that the bottleneck that it has here, the predinates tend to be very small. So you're forcing it to be very sparse. Um, you then have a second called comparator where you again compare these two short encodings and you have this over several heads, which is very reminiscent again of multi-head attention, for example. Um, so it's an architecture that again combines relational, this multi-head, this attention and whatnot. Um, and the idea behind predinets was also to um, have more, models that are able to do this relational reasoning uh, as well. Um, and to this end, uh, we also introduced um, a, a new task of data sets with these like very simple 2D shapes uh, with different colors and shapes for held out uh, combinations um, and different tasks, for example, where we had to say, oh, is this object between two other objects or not? Or does this object here occur in the line below? And so on. So there were a number of different tasks um, and long story short, this particular model, so PrediNet, which is the purple one, always did really well, not only on the tasks themselves, but also actually generalizing from one task to the other task. Um, when compared to, for example, uh, either just normal MLPs, which usually flatlined, um, or um, well, even multi-head attention, which is this red line here, um, which sometimes did actually quite well, but in other instances, maybe not, not, as, not as well. Um, cool. Um, so finally, I also mentioned so far, all the models that I've pointed out um, have a lot of this flavor of we have a static image. How do we look at relations the way maybe we would have done in symbolic reasoning? Um, but one of the things we also did in our paper uh, and that is kind of necessary for RL is you don't have static images. You usually are uh, tracking things over time. And if you are tracking objects or symbols over time, um, then this is uh, something that is also not trivial, right? Because if you think about it as an example, you can see uh, if you get these images of whatever environment um, and you pass them through Monet, which is this other uh, model that I presented earlier that was able to uh, uh, decompose 3D images into the separate objects, um, then Monet would be very good, as I mentioned, at giving you the individual objects, uh, as you can see here. Um, but then at different time steps, different uh, slots or the Monet might uh, output them in different order, right? Because there's nothing telling Monet to give them to you always in the same order, right? So here, this in the second position, one time it's that purple square, but then maybe the next time it might be a yellow one and so on. So there's no guarantee for models to actually always give them in the same order. And the model has no notion of continuity or object persistence. Um, so in our paper, um, what we did is we had this, we calculated the probability of an object being the same in the next frame by taking into account 
and like distance, the similarity in their types and so on, and some sort of transition matrix that we had between types. Um, but again, it was all not, not learned uh, except for the transition matrix. Um, but there's been since then actually good approaches at learning transition models between these type of symbolic um, uh, process uh, representations. And one of the most recent one is align that um, that essentially does exactly this. So it takes the inputs from Monet, um, and then when you pass it through the alignment, it basically makes sure that in every slot returned by Monet, you have the same object consistently across time. Um, and this helps you track objects and it deals with disappearing objects and reappearing objects and whatnot, and has some uh, transition model inside as well that allows for it to, for like, to uh, work with moving objects and whatnot. So this is, of course, much more sophisticated than our little solution that we had in the original paper. Um, and as you can see here, for example, it does a really good job. Um, so any line, I mean, you can look at here, for example, the last one. Um, oh, well, no, you actually, you should look across uh, columns. So if you look here at each column, you would like e every column to be the same object, uh, but it clearly isn't. Sometimes you have triangle, triangle, and then nothing, and then a square, and then nothing. Whereas once it has been aligned by alignment, you have, uh, well, background, oh, sorry. <laughs> background, then the circle, then the square, and the triangle. And then this is, if we're thinking of learning policies and object space, this is something that we can now work with, right? Because we have consistency across the time domain as well. Cool, so this was how do we process these representations? And then finally, in our particular example of the paper, we were doing RL, uh, so in a very simple environment. Um, there's been some work, obviously this last area is probably the least worked on just because it requires to first do parts one and two before you can actually scale this up. Um, there has been some work on planning, which I will mention. Um, actually, there's been a, a surprising amount of work on question answering, uh, which I guess lends itself well for this type of task because language is inherently quite symbolic. Um, and then I'll mention briefly theorem proving, but uh, that's something that's quite out of my uh, uh, knowledge. Um, so probably the most relevant to this crowd is uh, how to do planning NRL with this type of representations. And uh, there's two main models that have come out recently, uh, COBRA and OP3. Um, and the way COBRA works, COBRA is built on top of Monet, which if you remember again, is this model that takes can take either 3D or 2D scenes and decompose them in the individual objects. It's what uh, the alignment, for example, was also using. Um, and what you do is you take an image you use Monet here to uh, create these object-based representations. So each of those is you're hoping an object or symbolic for an object. Um, and then on top of that, you're learning, first of all, a transition model that like you can then later use for rollouts. Um, and then you also learn in, in parallel an exploration policy in order to actually get some in, to some interesting transitions because um, in this in particular environment objects only move one at a time um, and you don't and you would never get anywhere so essentially they train this in some adversarial manner to find states that the transition model is quite bad at predicting um, and then they train this in an unsupervised way so all they have is these images and they train this model to be able to predict the transitions and to to do this in these object latent space. So this transition model, as you see, actually works in the latent object space, which is really cool. Um, and then once this is trained, they fix this. And then on top of that, they just train uh, a reward prediction. And then they can do model-based search. So essentially, they do one-step rollout and then take, a, once the reward predictor is trained, take the one that is going to have the highest reward. Um, and that actually shows that they can get pretty good performance on, on this particular task. Um, the environment is this uh, simple 2D environment, and there's a number of different tasks. So for example, um, sorting, whereby you have to put each of the shapes on top of the circle that is of their color. So you can see the green square goes to the green cross and the red to the red. Um, there's clustering, where you want the objects to uh, cluster together by color, for example. Um, and what's really interesting as well is that in this paper, they apply these tasks also to some held out um, combinations of these tasks. So for example, you can cluster colors that you've never seen before, um, but the concept of clustering should still hold across these new um, colors. Um, and the results again are actually quite encouraging, especially for the generalization part. Um, this up here is just on normal test environments, which is great, all is good, it works. Um, but more interesting when we look here at the task irrelevant perturbations. So this means we change uh, characteristics about the task that shouldn't actually affect it, like changing the color, adding distractors, changing the number of targets that you need to sort, and so on, right? Fundamentally don't affect the task that you're trying to do. Um, and they compare the performance of COBRA, which is this algorithm, with different MPO baselines. Um, and what's really cool is that 
for most tasks, green being Cobra, it actually does really well, despite having new shapes, different colors, uh, different numbers of targets and distraction uh, and so on. Whereas like other more traditional models uh, don't do well at all. They do actually support with the new shapes, they do pretty well, but then everything else is, is quite, quite bad. Um, um, similar, we have uh, OP3, which is another planning uh, model. It is somewhat similar actually to the whole idea of, uh, um, of COBRA. Um, and essentially, again, this looks quite intimidating, but all you're saying is you have these H's which stand for the different objects and you have an action and you're trying to learn this transition model whereby each object is going to be influenced by an action, then it's going to relationally look at everyone else. So this again, very reminiscent of attention and relational learning. And then that is gonna be added on top of your object. So it's an update on your, on your object. And that just gives you a transition model for the objects. Um, and they show on this actually 3D environment, which is really cool. They throw that, uh, they show that um, if they start from this initial image, for example, and then the task is to um, have the agents move the blocks to this particular, uh, uh, position that theirs, which is this last uh, column over here, does really well. And you can see that this final row always matches with the second, which is uh, what you would want to be the case. <laughs> um, whereas other baselines are not as good as, as, as doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, I mentioned also maybe a bit less related or uh, visual Q&A. Uh, in particular, neural symbolic VQA, I think is a cool example of neural uh, uh, vision, uh, visual question answering. Um, and this is also a bit, the reason I mentioned it is a bit reminiscent of that paper that we did early on, whereby you first use the CNN to extract these like symbols and with their <clears throat> particular um, um, uh, properties and position and color and whatnot. And this is actually learned in a supervised manner. Um, and then in a second step, you actually use this to then learn how to, uh, in this particular case, answer questions. Um, and the way that this is done actually, and this is again, the, the second part is the RL part, is you're using uh, reinforce to given a question, generate a program. So there are certain actions that this uh, our agent can take um, uh, sequentially, and then it learns to output a, a list of actions that it has to do in order to find uh, the right answer to this, to this question. Um, and then essentially it gets a mix of the properties that it has been trained on, it gets the program, and then it has a program executor, and then it gives you the answer. So this is also a bit similar to what we said earlier with the uh, renderer, where you have built in <clears throat> a pre-built program that you're executing, and that kind of also dictates what your inputs <clears throat> produced by your network uh, are meant to look like. Um, and this looks works actually really well. They've tried it on this uh, Minecraft environment. Um, and for example, you're given the question, what direction is the closest creature facing, which I guess is this one. And then you say, okay, take the scene, filter a creature, filter whatever is the closest, uh, and then if check if it's unique and then query the direction and it tells you left. And then the program gets this uh, particular uh, set of uh, commands and then actually can provide the answer, which I think is also uh, really cool. Um, finally, I wanted to just mention uh, theorem proving and logical reasoning because obviously maths and logical reasoning is is inherently very symbolic and um, there has been a lot of work as well into trying to use deep networks to either use differential proving or to like do logic or using neural networks um, uh, and so on. Um, that is a whole line of work which is actually really fascinating. I'm not going to go into it today but if you're interested there is a, a big literature out there on that as well. Um, Cool, I think I'm also, haha, perfect, almost on time. Uh, just a quick summary. Um, there is some intuitive, and I guess there's also at this point experimental evidence that machine learning algorithms could benefit from uh, operating in this more symbolic space. Uh, there has been shown that it's definitely good for interpretability because it's something that we as humans can definitely deal better with. Um, it has been shown to sometimes help for generalization and robustness, uh, not necessarily maybe just in the case of disentanglement, but in general working at this object level space. Um, and it also has been shown to be more data efficient um, than just working in pixel space, for example. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that is still remains is that really having a formal definition of things like objects or even concepts, um, as well as even like really thinking about these different types of generalizations, it's still a challenge. I think there's initial steps towards actually doing this, but it's of course very, very, very complicated to even define what any of these very complicated notions and ideas are, right? Um, and I think that that will be a necessary first step that we need to take. Um, and I think there's slowly work going in and it's quite exciting, but uh, yeah, I think we're early early on in this very long journey. Thank you. I think that's the last slide, yeah. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, Martha. That's a thank very you. impressive tour into a cutting edge domain. It's, uh, it's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm not super uh, sharp on, on this domain, so I'm not sure that I would be able to forward the best questions and uh, with the best manner, um, but I'm going to try. Uh, so maybe uh, going upside down, uh, a first question would be about uh, the scalability of the, of the method that you are, you are providing. I read mm -hmm. the question, um, how do this uh, unsupervised object-based send decomposition models work on image with a little bit more complexity, uh, like uh, more complex object, uh, more than 3D shapes, and mm -hmm. generalize in the, in the presence of uh, uh, occlusion? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, okay, so uh, I'll say, firstly, um, in, in, in general, things like occlusion and lighting actually usually help um, if you have the right data set. So if you actually have a 3D environment where things occlude each other, but you have views from different viewpoints that actually has shown to help the models understand about what it means to be an object, right? If like something is covering something else and you get more of like a perception of depth, for example. Um, in general, it's very, very true that at the moment, all of these models, as you could tell, uh, work on these very simplified 3D shapes, um, which is a bit unfortunate, but I guess it is hard to scale up particularly small details, um, and also to get data sets that would support this amount of detail. Um, there's some interesting line of work right now popping up a lot with around, I don't know if you've heard of NERF, which are neural uh, uh, radiant fields, uh, which are um, able to reconstruct images from different viewpoints, very realistic images, so it's like the Taj Mahal and whatnot, um, from different new viewpoints, and people are now trying to use that for inference. So that could be actually quite interesting if you can have like these very high resolution images and carry out inference on them. Um, but it is true that at the moment with the methods we have, this is probably at the moment where we are at in terms of uh, ability to infer and reconstruct lots of tiny details. Yeah, unfortunately. I don't know if that answers the question, by the way, I'm happy to. <laughs> I think it's a pretty competent, sir. Thank you. Um, so, Bavin Shoksi is uh, asking, uh, um, have people tried discretization, quantization, instead of de-entanglement? Sorry, it's a word that I'm not able to pronounce, uh, whatever the, the number of time I, I try to pronounce it. Do you have some uh, intuition whether this would work or, or not, discretization or quantization? I'm not sure of what... Uh, mm, yeah. yeah, 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 that makes sense. So, uh, oops, okay. Um, then, um, okay, let's get started with the door. Um, so yes, discredit, I say, yes. So people have definitely thought about uh, one, one way, okay, that the world is divided, especially in the symbolic uh, realm, is as you mentioned by discrete entities. Um, discrete variable models have been historically quite hard to train. People have tried to train uh, discrete variable models. And also with representations that are partly discrete, partly not discrete and so on. Um, inference on those models tends to be quite hard, which is I think why people often do rather this iterative thing rather than the discrete thing. Um, also because often it's not, not clear if you discretize, for example, color objects, what an interpolation between these discrete variables would look like, right? If you interpolate it like one is chair and two is table, then what if, if, you, if there's no meaning going between one and two, right? Um, so it's not super trivial how to discretize spaces as well. Um, but definitely a lot of people claim that it is actually ultimately necessary to have some sort of discreteness in your in your data. Does that make sense? Okay, pretty long and uh, multi-stage question from Gilles Richard. Um, do you generate extract only binaries pre predicate or can you extract more general predicate? Like... Um, uh, predicate like under object A and object B, uh, object A is under object B, uh, or can you generalize that to predicate with several uh, several um, inputs, spread of A, B, C, D, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so in this particular one, we were just looking at binary, in, in my paper from ages ago, uh, we were just looking at like uh, the binary uh, interactions, mostly because we also, the, the environment only required that because the only thing really moving was the agent, right? So you didn't really need anything more complex for that particular environment. And um, other follow-up work that you could see, for example, from the program synthesis and whatnot, um, they do have functions that can take on more than just binary predicates. So they can take 
any amount of, of input and you can really define that however you want i guess that will depend up on your on your environment mm. um, maybe the next question is you generate exact function symbols usable in your predicates um i don't know what can you clarify on that apart from list operator And then, uh, thanks for pointing out William Cohen. I'll check him out. Thanks. Yeah, it's difficult uh, to, uh, to have a um, real-time interaction uh, through this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, well, we are maybe the limit of, uh, a clarification to two then. Uh, if you, then I can have a little look at that. OK. Uh, I, I think uh, um, the, the next question is uh, raising very interesting uh, topic. Do you see any way of removing human inter intervention from this process, or do you think it's fundamentally incorporated? Uh, I think there will always be some incorporation of human uh, intervention, mostly because we are trying to, it, it depends a bit what we want, but if what we want at the end of the day is to interact with, with these agents and to make them interpretable for us, then inherently we have to be part of that process, right? Because there's nothing in the world that necessarily has to by chance fall into the, our way of kind of thinking about things. Um, so there'll always be a human in the loop. Um, I guess what we're trying to do is to minimize the amount of what we have to do, right? So rather than, for example, sitting down and like labeling a huge data set by hand, can we add some biases to our model that will then uh, e make it easier for us to understand what's going on or to understand, to have better representations, right? Or think of a training regime that actually gives us certain, uh, uh, results with certain properties and so on, right? So I think that's the trade-off that we're kind of thinking about. But ultimately, we will have to uh, design a lot of these things for them to be compatible with our way of thinking, I think. In what you presented, uh, I understood that there is a, a clear separation between uh, the, the part that is trained to produce symbols and then the, the task that is uh, using the, the symbols to drive the the behavior mm -hmm. of the robot, in particular, in uh, the, the behavior of the agent, in particular in the domain of uh, reinforcement learning. And then, as you mentioned, clearly there is an issue in terms of generating a data set that is huge enough to generate the right symbols. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, reinforcement learning is, is there uh, for, for this reason. Why, when, when we don't have the, the right data set, the data set are not big enough, we let mm -hmm. the agent to, uh, to live his life and, uh, and mm -hmm. collect data, and then we can improve the behavior of, uh, of the agent mm -hmm. through the data that is collecting. Do you see any any um, any direction for that for for the RL to be done in the loop of uh, training symbols, uh, yeah. being able to, uh, to to get more symbolic extraction from mm -hmm. the behavior of the agent, maybe uh, possibly having a, yeah. a, a numerical RL first, something that is not working with symbols first, and mm -hmm. that uh, while time is going, uh, start to uh, trigger some uh, recurrent symbols and uh, improve uh, and. Uh, uh, strengthen yeah. the behavior of the of the gens with symbols. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question, actually. And I think, I mean, if we look at humans, and again, I'm not claiming that I know how the human body works, but in general, one could argue that we are also learning as we go, right? As we learn our generative models, we're also already acting in the world. Um, I guess the question there is, how do we design a reward um, that allows us to learn these symbolic representations, right? How because the, the reward usually of a task is very sparse. And, and if it's particular to a task, then it doesn't necessarily conduce to like learning, for example, a particular set of representations, right? Um, in addition, often uh, what this means is that uh, a particular set of representations will be very overfitted to that particular task, right? So if we wanna learn some general symbolic, we might have to learn, we could do it as part of some sort of RL training, but we might would have to make sure that the reward signals we're getting actually guide us there, right? So you could argue that as a human, we have loads of different rewards driving our predictive behavior, our interactions, and so on and so on, uh, rather than just maybe something as simple as get food, which could be seen as one, right? So I guess what that would then involve is actually designing a whole set of rewards that through RL guide us to the symbolic representations, which of course would be ideal, right? Because then we could say, yeah, you're learned within the environment that you want to do it. Um, and the question is whether we have the right reward and the right environment, I guess, <laughs> and the right agent, <laughs> all of it. Um, Nicola, I think you're muted, slash you are. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> um, so while you were answering the question, we have uh, Leslie Cabling that uh, just connected. Uh, so we are just finishing the question se session of, uh, of Marta. Um, maybe just a, a last question to finish. Uh, so, uh, a question from Daniele Kirubel. Uh, 
uh, might more explicit recurrent connections help in stabilizing symbolic representations as in continuous attractor models? Or mm. uh, is it unfeasible in deep learning and like spiking models? And yeah, nice uh, uh, grid talk to finish the question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, that's a good question. So there has been a lot of work and actually in my former lab, I should really know more about this. They did a lot of the particularly attractor networks and recurrent networks. Um, it hasn't really gone off the ground yet and it might, yeah, and I think a lot of the effort currently is fo overly focused on this other type of network. So while I have no real intuition whether that would help or not, it's definitely, I think, a bit underexplored and so far it hasn't worked yet. So I think that's why people are steering a bit clear of it. Um, but who's to say? Like, I, I've seen good results from the lab actually on like simpler tasks. So maybe, yeah, if I was more familiar, <laughs> I could probably judge better. 